Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're here with Professor uh, Ronnie Burridge. Did I say your last name right? Burridge. Burridge. Yes. How are you, sir? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, first of all. Yeah, thanks for having me, Antonio. Thank you, man. This is cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I was listening earlier to, I don't think, I don't know if it's your most recent album. Um, hold on. I got it right here. Dance of the Great Spirit. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. um. well, that was the last one released, like the year of COVID, unfortunately. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah I love, I, I love the, the whole album, but I love the name of your group as well. Oh, Holographic Principle. Yeah. How'd you come up with that name? So, you know, that's, uh, I'm a sci-fi science hit. My father was a uh scientist um okay. working with the company a couple of companies um in st louis where i was born uh one was a chemical company and the other one was i think um national lead and um some other company and so you know i grew up with all of these different um theories and ideas and he was also a race car driver really? you know he used to drag race and he used to race uh cars very fast and as a youngster, you know, this is probably nothing that parents should not do, but hey, in the era when I grew up in the 60s, we drive fast down the highway and he says, look at how the wind blows the rain off the windshield. You know, if you go past this amount of speed, you don't see it at all, and blah, blah, blah. So we're just like, mm. ah, you know, so everything was about um, <laughs> all of these things related to science. And, you know, we look at Star Trek together and it's like, He'd explain to me how to get to a Mach 1 and the speed it took and all of these types of things. So, mm. you know, I got involved in reading a bunch of different um, science fiction novels and just the whole different concepts about string theories and things like that. And I heard about a string theory called um, the Holographic Principle, where the theory, in fact, is it's a film that happens before you go through a wormhole or a black hole, it has the ability to imprint the DNA of whatever the physical subject is going through that hole. So, and the concept is when you come through the other side, that film travels with you and it can put you together whole. Mm. So I thought that was perfect for the music that I do and write because I want to take people somewhere. And when we bring them back, I want them to have, understand that they had a, a real experience, but they can also relate it to how their lives are. So I just felt that was an amazing title for uh, my band and the uh, the music that we present. And believe it or not, we got a lot of fans from that. Like, um, I think the first time we played at a couple of clubs in New York, guy was like, hey, man, how'd you come up with that name? You know, I was like, and I told him the story. He's like, yeah, I'm a scientist. You did it to uh, me. You did it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. That's that. You picked from like a different discipline and it made sense for what you do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I know, I know, I'm not sure that it's a it's such a different discipline. I mean, as composers and as musicians, we, we um, are able to uh, live in all of those different types of disciplines because our music is somewhere, if, you know, if we're thinking of doing um changing the waveform and different doing things differently touching on people's spirituality spirituality as well as their uh the unknown as well as the known i think we're we're scientists in that 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 realm because music has the ability to to reach people in on all types of ways frequencies emotionally um all types of things so i'm not so sure if they don't, if and I believe they're supposed to work hand in hand, you know. Um, but you know, you that's know. interesting. That's actually an interesting point because a, a lot of people look at something like science as like uh, hard nose, fact based, research based, that kind of thing, and then people look at music as creativity and coming from maybe somewhere else, not so rigid as something like science. So it's interesting to hear someone as accomplished as yourself in music to kind of be like, no, they they work together. Yeah, because I also think in the sciences, they're, they're ever evolving. I mean, yes, you, they have hard factual things, but then you have scientists that are saying that, oh, well, there must be 
a, a higher power mm. that brought us to this place. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. science doesn't explain everything. It uh, that's what I mean. So yeah. for me, I think they're interwoven. I mean, music is based on mathematical calculations. In fact, certain parts of music and rhythm. But when you start expounding and expanding those rhythms and other types of things that are based on emotions or 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 a harmonic frequency between notes that makes it do something else, then you know how do you explain that? And I think those are you know, those are all part of those mysteries of the universe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I've always looked at music as kind of like its own language. It's mm -hmm. like a language that certain people can read and write, but we all kind of understand it in a sense, mm -hmm. whether, whether you like music that's as intricate as jazz music, or if you just like pop music that makes you feel good, something on the radio, um, you know, you, you might not be a musician, but you can, sympathize or, or or you can feel something with that music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you understand it in a sense absolutely and so you know therefore i'm sorry from so much um music that i've uh been informed and been been honing and working with people around the world to play and when you make it 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 for me it, it's the it's our last natural healing force because it does have the ability to reach people in all kinds of ways, you know. I mean, we do know that there's been, been been messages, coded messages in music that are the opposite of positive thought. But at the same time, it's really based on if you look at like the African and the indigenous people song, um, the word music is synonymous with with um um uh something that's beautiful. It's a it's something that's made song is like a a, a beauty. And then and if you look at it like I worked with some autistic children years ago, and we're talking about mathematics, right? What they related to was how if you play a certain rhythm and they're feeling and counting that rhythm, they actually related to that. And it made them do something musically um, or it made them pay attention in a certain way or just change the trajectory of what they were doing at that moment, you know? And all of that stuff is related to um, to music. And like you say, some of those facts base of, of math and all of those types of things and science. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's vast. Sure, sure. To your point, you know, we were speaking of like indigenous peoples. It's also very ritualistic for, for a group mm -hmm. where, it, again, it kind of transcends. I'm. It, it's not just I'm enjoying this. It's almost a different purpose. You're using it for something else. Absolutely, absolutely. For healing, the uh, you know, there's um, different people in the Congo, um, certain tribes that you know, exercise. What they is 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 um, shamanism or voodoo or something like that. But it's always based to music because music has the ability to put the the person into a trance state. And sometimes you know they'll have a a, a surgical procedure to heal them through this music happening. And they don't even know that it's happening. Sure. You know, I mean, and that's been proven in history. Um, and that's one of the reasons why some of those ritual types of cultural things are outlawed here because it, it denies uh, medical, the, med the, the pharmaceuticals and the medica medicines that they try to give you for something that could be done naturally, you know. It's, so there's all types of things. My feeling is that all of those things need to come together, you know, to make our society and our culture better. Mm. Music has a valuable place in the sciences and in the arts and in medicine and everything, you know? So a lot of those things are denied because it's not understood, you know? Right. And like I said, it keeps a lot of money out of a lot of people's pockets. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the way, that's, that's the way when <laughs> I don't know if because I'm otherwise, oh, that stuff is only something that savages do or, or un yeah. unintelligent people. Right. Meanwhile, it's been saving lives for thousands of years in different places in the world. Right, right. You're never going to see a uh, like a, a a CNN go uh, brought to you by music. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's always going to be brought to you by something else. Yeah. Right. Right. No, I agree because of course there is 
you know, one of the modern marvels is modern medicine, but mm -hmm. you can't deny the the uh, effectiveness of of something like music or something like mm -hmm. holistic uh, remedies. Yeah, yeah, man, absolutely. So, so was it, it, like I said, I did listen to the album, and I thought it was really, really interesting, really intricate, and it was it was like something you know I don't normally listen to. And, okay, and I did like it. I liked it a lot. How do you go about making something like that because like i said there's a lot of different moving parts even the way the vocals are like they're the uh what is it the um was it last black man i'm sorry what's the name god's only black man god's only black like even in there where you're is it you speaking yes yeah like you're using your voice differently as opposed to just singing and then there's the obviously the sounds and it's it's very very interesting how do you go about making something like that so that particular piece is a very valuable piece for my life. I've been hearing it my entire life. My grandfather wrote that piece a hundred or so years ago. Mm. It's in the archives of Mahatma Gandhi, um, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. Um, and he wrote profound music that had, you know, historical lessons for our people in all types of ways. He wrote profound literature that dealt with, um, you know, um, um, justice for all people, um, telling the stories of, of um, indigenous people. I'm, 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 he's got thousands of poetry, um, published poems too, and but never a book. But that particular piece, I grew up hearing it uh, because it was one that people used to come to our home and visit him and, you know, I'm saying like people from London and all these different places because they heard it was in these particular archives and they heard of his work as, you know, somebody um, in America. And so for me, it became an anthem. It became something that was very, that made me very proud to be who I am and to understand that my, my lineage comes from Africa and that we're strong people. So the you know basically all of that music and mostly all uh music from many cultures around the world is based on um call and response so some of the things i did with the poem as so as echoing certain words and things like that in a different voice or a different color uh represents that particular aspect of call and response right um and then uh when i got to the point where I, I said I had to write some music to it, the piece came kind of whole in my head. I heard it orchestrated. Since what you've heard recorded, I've actually um, orchestrated it for like a 30-piece orchestra with strings and, wow. and a full choir and a full symphonic percussion section, uh, you know, a big band. It's incredible. Um, so that first it, that first recording of it, uh, I had people from my church choir handpicked to sing some of the uh, the choral parts you heard on there. I per I played pretty much all of the keyboards and all of the percussion and the vocals on there. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure. It's interesting that it, it's it's uh, so the words were written a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And then you mm -hmm. just, you, you, you modernized it with the sound. Yeah, absolutely. What you um, think, you think it'd be a good idea to um play it for the listeners. I mean, if you guys can share, I can share a screen, I can play the audio. What are you, are we going to get copywritten stuff on YouTube? No, I mean, I wrote the song. You shouldn't be having any problems. <laughs> no, right. With you, with you definitely, but YouTube might flag us. Ah, YouTube. See, yeah, they have to fix that, man, because I'm so tired of that. I had a, a a radio show under my brand, Moby, Music of the Black Experience, and uh, I was interviewing people and playing music from you people on the show. They gave me permission to play their music, mm -hmm. and YouTube flagged it and just put a blank spot while it was playing. And I'm like, I'm writing them over and over. I'm like, here is the consent from the artist, the copyright artist. Here's the consent from me, the artist of the music that I played that I wrote. I never got a response. Mm. And uh, 
it's it's they they need to fix that and they need to fix it till because it's another reason why I don't get paid for all of my streaming because uh you know when people move stuff over to YouTube that that has nothing to do with the fact that I should get paid when somebody clicks on my song or you know I should get asked for somebody to use it I don't none of that happens but then they flag me <laughs> when I when I do something like this you know right right uh, yeah. so it's crazy but um. Yeah, it would be will it'd be worth a shot to try it. And if they you know, and when you whenever you is this live podcast or are we gonna No, no, gonna we're record it? we're recording it. It'll it'll be out tomorrow. It's not a problem. Okay, so I mean we I mean, I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let yeah. let's try it. Give it a go. Let's try it. Okay. All right, let me pull it up and then and when I'm ready, you guys can give me permission to share screen. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. Let me do this here. I do agree with you about the YouTube stuff though. It is uh it's ridiculously stupid. Yeah. Especially <laughs> I mean, for, for someone that's making their own stuff like you are and, and you know, you, you yeah, hope. To... And the problem is that I, you don't, I don't get any, um, you don't get um, any answer backs when you're, when you're sending something through their channels. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's like, yeah. You know? So, right. Right. Let's see. There's also been a, a short video made to it by uh, an award-winning video videographer, but I'll just pull up the music. Let me see if I have it. Here. Okay. Let's see. Go back this is behind-the-scenes stuff for the people. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. That makes the best. Yeah. What I mean, I think now is a great time for for musicians because you can do things uh, independent independently and it's and it, you still gain a lot of traction right yeah right absolutely yeah let's see it should be coming up let's see here and this is uh god's only black man correct right right okay i think i, I think the fastest way is for me to pull it up on dropbox okay yeah let me do that and then i can play the audio the cover art is also really cool I do like the color. Oh man, thank you. That was um uh put together by uh an incredible um graphic artist in St. Louis, my cousin actually. <laughs> ah. Yeah. It all runs in the family. You guys are all artists. Yeah, I, I was like, hey, you know, I really need something to to evoke um you know, our background and earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> So that's what, uh, let's see if this one, let's see if this is the one here. Very cool. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's see. Now I can, if you, if I can share screen. Does that pop up on our end? Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys have to allow me to do it. It's okay now? Let's see. This Host is able participant. You are uh, you're our trial run on the on the Zoom episodes in the new in the okay. new stuff. so so <laughs> you're helping us out yeah because I was wondering because you all you all have always been set up differently yeah, yeah like yeah. you're looking like right into the camera but now you're looking off to the side right. I guess when yeah. you look straight in the mic you're looking at me it feels like you're looking at me right 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 because I got you up on the TV over here to the right oh I see I see yeah. let's see. Is there a uh, an option to let him screen share? Yeah, try to find it now. Okay. Please hold, everybody. Well, again, with this, this is the uh, this is the uh, the fun part, the learning part. Yeah, this is the yeah the behind the scenes. It's nice. In the meantime, <laughs> speaking of all of these uh, wonders, did you guys see witness the eclipse? Yes, very. cool. I did at least. I don't know if Billy. Did you see it, Billy? I, I did see it. I wasn't impressed. Really? <laughs> you weren't impressed? Oh, man. I'm glad it'll be another 40 years till the next one. <laughs> but you should be wow. good. You should be good to share the screen now. Okay, let's see. I felt a certain energy when I was out there doing that. Um, oh, me too, man. I felt Billy. It was crazy. Yeah. Billy's alone in this one. <laughs> did you have, uh, Antonio, did you get the uh, glasses from the library? Uh no, um, from the Museum of Natural History, they were giving free ones out right down from. Oh, where... nice! Yeah, I yeah, tried yeah. to get to the library on time. They were all gone. Yeah, so yeah. I have this very, very 
thick old sunglasses and then I have my bike riding you know I'm a bike rider I have this visor tinted visor so I put both of those on and peeked at it pretty much the whole time every once in a while and I could see it moving um, all the way to when it was almost a sickle sure it's pretty impressive to me I thought it was crazy I thought it was really yeah, cool. I was at work and I was outside not paying attention to what I was supposed to be doing and I was just <laughs> staring at the uh, uh, at this guy yeah yeah it was yeah. cool all right, so here we go. Let's give it a blast. Sure, let's do it. Black. Wait, I'm sorry. There we Black. Go. There we go. Classification. Species Man Ethnic origin of release here.
black am I with a soul that's hung to eternity? Beyond earthen floors, my feet stand upon a soul that's worthy of its keep. Within my black and physique of man, within this black and physique of man. Black with wool to stand under the sun flattened nostrils, to fill good lungs with drafts of air, to flip sweet songs. Through powdered lips of berry flesh, a lit with happiness, bubbling fresh. <laughs> yeah yeah right don't flag us youtube this is the guy that made that don't uh don't screw us here <laughs> yeah. i think you should put in there anyway you know that you have my permission and uh yeah. put the link to the to the song or something on youtube because it's on youtube so. yeah yeah for sure yeah. um what's that in the middle up there is That's that on... telling us to go to the next meeting should we go to the next meeting then yeah all right okay all right. Let me se- let me send you that now, folks. We'll uh, we'll hop back on in just a, f- a few minutes. We'll be back. Perfect. Well, all right. We're uh, we're back, everybody. Thank you uh, for bearing with us again. Like we mentioned momentarily or uh, previously, this is our uh, yes. our first go with Zoom on the on the new setup, and uh, we just finished listening to uh, God's Only Black Man. Fantastic. Um, it reminded me while I was listening to it. It reminded me. I don't know if you've ever listened to the. Uh, the old, I think is, uh, what was it? Steve Allen and Jack Kerouac. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It reminded me of that because because of the poetry and the and the music at the same time. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I thought you was gonna say Gil Scott Heron, but uh, sure, I sure. Back, that Steve Allen and Jack Kerouac kind of goes further back, and I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gil absolutely. Scott Heron as well. I uh, I've I've recently gotten into him and. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, that's and, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love um what is it? Uh Whitey on the Moon. Yeah. Um and the other one with uh where he goes, I forget the name of it. Um he's talking about words. Semantics is a bitch. Libya used to be in Africa, now it's in the Middle East. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know that one too. Yeah. That's yeah. that's heavy. For sure. Yeah, For sure. Absolutely. So um, I I did read a, a bit of your bio and uh, before we started this and you you've pretty much been doing music since a child. Like mm-hmm. and you used to sing and you still do sing. But how did you go from, uh, I guess, strictly singing to deciding to play what I think is the most impressive instrument, a drum kit? Um, how did you decide to switch? Well, you know, there was never a switch. Those things were going on simultaneously. Mm. So again, let's go back to my grandfather because he was the head of a household. My mother was the oldest of eight children. 
He had a grand piano. My mother played grand piano. She had five brothers underneath her. Uh, one of them played a drum kit. <laughs> the other one played a trombone. One of them played a a, a, a bass guitar. No, the one that played trombone was bass. I'm kind of listening to them chronologically. Okay, my mom's the oldest. The brother under her really didn't play anything. He dabbled at a guitar, but he was a motorcycle rider and made things from scratch. Then under him was my uncle who played trombone and bass guitar, electric bass. The uh, uncle under him was Noel. He was born on Christmas Noel, and he played uh, a drum set, and he played concert uh, snare drum and timpani in uh, university that he went to. So he was, there was always drums in the house. So by the, by when I was crawling, they told me I was beating on pots and pans. I was singing rhythms, banging on the piano. I'm messing with everybody's instrument. Underneath that uncle was my uncle Rasul Sadiq, who just passed last uh, January. He was a trumpeter who also played drums proficiently. So <clears throat> he too had a set of drums in the house. Then the youngest uncle played tennis saxophone. So out of all of that, I played piano. I was singing. I'm playing drum set. I played trombone and bass guitar, all learning at the same time in the household. And then on the other side of the family, my grandmother's uh, brother, Uncle John, played tennis saxophone with people like Bessie Smith out of Chicago blues bands. And when they came to St. Louis, the band would come and there were jam sessions in the house. And I would be trying to sing with them and playing the drums. So everything was happening at the same time. It wasn't like, you know, strictly this or strictly that. So sure, that's kind of like my background. Um, the, 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 you know, different types of press and things like that say that I was a child prodigy. I don't believe that because I was not technically proficient on all of those instruments until, and until my teens, you know. I'm not like these children now who are three or four and they can sit around and play a box sonata and uh, yeah. or a Nat King Cole solo, you know, or a Duke Ellington piece. No, uh, I was my my piano prowess was was developing my ear. What I love to do my best practice as a very young person was to pick out film scores that I heard on the television, like big cinematic melodies. Uh, because the television was always going in my grandparents' house. And it was in the room right next to the piano. So that's how I think I became, uh, I started composing at a very early age because I was so enthralled with orchestrations. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it so that's kind of like what happened. Right. Well, it doesn't sound like an accident. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> you ended up doing what you ended up doing because no. you know it, you, it, it it runs in your family yeah yeah it runs in my family and it's definitely i recognize that what happened to me was a gift from something bigger than me because i was also i'm also an athlete right i played i thought i was going to be the first black hockey player i played hockey for seven years yeah <laughs> you know and um through a lot of racist stuff. You know, we were in, in St. Louis, I played on the city team where it was white. All of those guys were like my family. You know, they protected me because I, I loved the game. And there was, you know, St. Louis City, it was different. I didn't feel the racism from the people I worked with. But when we went out of town to Illinois or to Ohio to play a game or something, then boy, oh, yeah. the words my mother and I heard, the names we were called, I wasn't allowed to be on the ice. Turns out black people invented hockey up in uh, Nova Scotia. So if you really go back and do the homework, yeah, you'll know that, right? I was going to mention at that time. Yeah. It's the same thing that it's the same problem that we're dealing with right now. We see it unfolding with Beyonce. They're like, you can't sing country because that's not your music. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> this our country is so far behind and so ignorant with this racist stuff. That's why we can't get anywhere. That's yeah. why we don't understand. We should all be supporting each other, loving each other, so our children can feel safe 
and we can protect each other. We are in the dark ages with that mentality of racism. It's, yeah. it's, it has to stop. Yeah. Well, you know, we are, we are unfortunately still uh, tribal monkeys at the mm. end of the day. We're still, uh, you know, very much wrapped in ideology and wrapped in a certain way of, uh, of, of thinking that blocks people from thinking other ways that could potentially benefit them and the, and the greater good of everything. So mm. I, um, I, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. I, I do believe that uh, ideology across the board is, can be a scary thing and, and it, racism oh. is an ideology. It is a scary thing. I mean, they've already, certain <laughs> states have banned talking about black people in America. Mm. Because people don't want their children to feel guilty for the things that their ancestors did. Come on, man. Right. We, we have to move forward by telling the truth. You cannot whitewash history. Right. And anytime Sorry. people are are are, are banning uh, words or books, is that's never good either. People are, you know. Oh, no. Um, and that's exactly where we are. So we need to wake up. We need to wake up and, and, and say, no, no, we have to tell the truth. We got to move forward by right. understanding the things we did that were wrong, period. Right. And 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 what makes us all similar. The other. Yeah. That's the other thing. We have more things in common than we do different. Sure. I sure. mean, the simple fact that we all need air, we, we all need water. We all we all bleed and die from the same diseases. Yes. We all get strung out on the same drugs. <laughs> and it ends you know, the... it's like, come on, man. Right. Stop. Right. We have to stop. And this you know? and the most important thing is that this ride for all of us ends the same way. It right. literally ends the same way. So yeah. you know, what's the sense in existing uh in this tribe tribalism and and you know it, it I agree with you. I agree with you hundred percent. And I think most people would agree with you. Besides, you know, I hope so. Nowadays, it's it's scary because it's you you see, you see so much evidence to the contrary, mm. um, you know. And then you see all these. You cannot take billions of dollars into the grave. What's it going to do with? Uh, what, what are you going to do with the with the money? I mean, everybody are hoarders in this country of things that they think that they made. You didn't make it. You 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 made it from off the backs of other people. Sure. And then you used it to continue to oppress other people. Right. Right. Well, it's with anything that we that anybody makes, you know, are, is it is it really you making it or did the like where did the idea even come from? Exactly. Like, we're obviously talking about music, uh, you know, or we've been talking about music, but you can apply that to anything like. Yeah, I'm applying it to anything, right? everything yeah. right now, not just music. I kind of moved on from music because sure. our problems are much bigger than than trying to keep us in a box with music. You know, our problems are so, so many walls, homophobia, separatism, racism, hatred, all of these things are just getting us nowhere, you know? Sure, sure. So, yeah, I, I yeah. do believe that. But there is a, a part of me that also believes that as bad as all those things are, uh, and, as, and as much as I disagree with all of those things in terms of, you know, racism and, and homophobia and all that stuff, um, I also believe that people do have the right to say things. Absolutely. I don't believe in, I don't love the idea of censorship in any facet. No. Um, but again, it is the, the, the tribal ape mind that kind of keeps us feuding with each other over these things. Mm -hmm. But sure. you're touching on something that should be at the core of humanity. We should mm. be able to agree to disagree. And still move forward trying to perpetuate life. Yes. Yes. To me, that should be the core of what's make, what makes us human beings. I don't have to like what you said. I don't have to agree with it. But that doesn't mean that what you say is more valid than me. And what I say is more valid than you. We should be able to move forward, still agreeing to disagree, but making sure that we, we're moving in a way that's safe for our children and us to be able to say the things that, you know, they realize or the things that they, you know, to have these differences. That's, that makes a viable culture. 
you know, sure. you, you 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 have to have the yin and the yang. You have to have those things to disagree about. But those th things to disagree about fundamentally shouldn't make us want to kill each other because somebody does not is coming from the mouth of somebody that does not look like us. Right. Right. I mean, it's just this, the simple idea of of a war, like the idea that we still have wars and fight each other. <laughs> is is kind of weird it's kind of strange that we've gotten to this age however long we've been around fundamentalists say one thing i subscribe to the idea that we've been around for tens of thousands of years um how are we still f killing people for what land for a belief for a god for a one that th that we disagree for you know it's 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 very weird mm -hmm. oh yeah it's very weird you know, they touched on a lot of that. Have you seen the new film Oppenheimer? Yes. It's at the core of what they were talking about. The man believed, okay, I had a job to make this thing, but fundamentally, it was not correct. We should not have done that, you know? Sure. His, his, his moral compass. And then what happened to him? He got blackballed for how many years? You know, I mean, it's like, those are the things that... that we should be able to look at all sides and, um, you know, come to some kind of consensus that, okay, look, uh, you, you know, we have to move forward, not backwards. Sure. Sure. No, I, I, yeah, definitely. And, but one thing we can agree on as humans across the board is that good music is a great way to build camaraderie. I think it's a great way. Yeah. To, I mean, you look at a festival or you look at a concert, everyone's jumping and singing and, and, and it's like, whoever is on the stage is kind of commanding this. I don't want to say forced, but it's, it's like a, a universal feeling that everybody's feeling together at the same time. Yeah. And you know, when that synergy happens, that's something coming from bigger than the artist. Yes. And at that moment, my concept is that the artist has a responsibility to say certain things that we're dealing with to get people in that moment when we're all connected to look next to each other and say, oh, that guy looks totally different from me, but he's grooving off the same thing I am. Sure. You know, we have a response. When I'm on stage, I mean, not just as an educator, but all my life before I even went into um, academia or anything, I've, I've always taught that you deal with your current issues through the music, and you uh, express that to the people because you have a platform to do that, you know? <clears throat> so I come from from growing up listening to music in community centers where we were always talking about the problems of the community and then the larger, broader spectrum. Mm. And every artist and person that uh, I dealt with used that as a platform to expose people to different types of poetry, to other types of... Uh, philosophies to other types of literature to other types of art and so you know as somebody that gets these opportunities no matter how big or small I think it's our job to do that you know I think some of the marketing and some of the uh, commercialism of uh, music has taken that out of the minds of the artists you know mm. we don't we don't we, we don't have any what, what we don't have any modern day Bob Dylan's or you know, Nat King Coles or people that were dealing with things that were happening and 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 using that to expose people to or Nina Simone's, you know. Sure. Um, or it's so, but you, it, yeah, go it, ahead. It, I'm sorry. No, it's it's at least uh, concentrated. I would say now, whereas yeah, before it may have been mainstream. Like if you look at the like one of my favorite human events ever was Woodstock, 1969, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. The, in that time, that was kind of the standard for artists to talk about how bad the Vietnam War is and how we need, you know, the civil rights movement and, and right. uh, all those. Now it's kind of like a few artists like Kendrick Lamar will write an mm -hmm. album or make an mm -hmm. album and it'll it'll detail some of the struggles people like him and in his community and, and, and that mm -hmm. uh, in that vein. Um, it's a little more concentrated now because I think and, you, you know, you could tell me um there's a lot of money to be made today in music, mm -hmm. like across the board. Yeah. 
Yeah. So so what you're what you're touching on now is the commercialism of it. We mm. still the music nowadays is still is owned by like four major distribution houses, right? Mm. And they pretty much control the content, you know. And and it's just like black actors in film or theater. There's only so many of them that they're gonna allow to work. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a plethora of hugely talented writers, not just black, but even young writers. Have you noticed like most of the stuff that comes out on our streaming platforms are rehashes of stuff that happened 60 and 70 years ago? Yes. You know, there's they're not allowing a lot of people to, you know, bring us something new. You know, you have to so that in music, that format is what's been crushing us. They'll put all the, the nasty derogatory rap you can imagine in the black community. That's where it started to try to make people mentally think that that's what's happening as opposed to and then they dangle the money in front of the artists it's like if you do this we'll put you on videos and movies and blah 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 blah. but when you start talking about something real your audience uh kendrick kendrick was able to blow up he reached a lot of people but the things that he's doing now isn't talking about those elements as powerful as it was mm -hmm. You know, so it's 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 a uh, it's time run. You have to be focused, and you have to be uh, you have to understand how how this 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 commercialism feeds people a concept, and it doesn't allow the artist to actually be truly an artist and free to say what he wants. You know, he has to do it uh, a, a cunning way. You know, I, I I give props to Beyonce. I don't care what people say. She's doing a lot of things and she's doing a lot of things, bringing attention to a lot of the things that we are dealing with that aren't positive in this country. And she's doing it in a commercial viable way. You right. know, um, there should be every artist should be doing this. Every uh, we should have our own distribution houses and not owned by uh, white business conglomerates, you know, that control how certain artists are going to work and how they're going to make money and how this, that, and the other. My music, a lot of the mainstream jazz radio stations do not play my music because I don't conform in a traditional jazz setting. I'm labeled as a jazz musician. Meanwhile, my background, I played every type of music imaginable. You know, I've been on the stage with the Allman Brothers. I've been on, on stage with Frank Zappa. I've been on, you know, I've played with in all types of musical settings. Um, and my music, you know, is 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 not a product that they want to push as a commercial jazz album. And that's fine with me because I don't want to be in that mix. Right. Over time, when people go back and hear my, my records, not one song is going to sound like another. It's all original and it's all about something that has to do with my living experience or the experience of people before me as I tell it through a musical story. And those things are important. And, and I try to write for something new to try to make people think a new way. You know, I'll use a rhythm in a different format. And that's all okay with me because I pride myself as being an original artist, you know, and, um, and and when I, like I said, no matter how big or small my audience is, if I have a chance to be in front of people, I'm going to talk about this story and not to a fact where it's going to be like, oh, we came to hear music and not you talk, but you'll hear it through the music. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's so, built in. It's important, you know. Well, the best, the best uh, art in any facet, music or, uh, you know, anything else, dance, movies, uh, the best the best artists are the ones that can make stuff that represents who they are. Like you, mm -hmm. you watch a Quentin Tarantino movie, you know, he made that movie. Yeah. Right. You listen to somebody and you're like, Oh, especially if you know them personally, you're like, Oh, that guy's a pretty calm guy. And his music reflects that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to me, that's always the best is when mm -hmm. the art reflects the artist. It's like mm -hmm. just an extension of themselves, right? Right. Well, and but and the thing that's that makes the artists separate too is something like those, like Quentin Tarantino. His movies are, you know, they're right in your face. Like 
whatever he's thinking, he's going to make it visual to you. And it's, and it was, it works your imagination. Right. As an artist, you're supposed to stretch people's minds and imagination, you know? Right. Right. Right, right, right. That's the whole thing about art. It's supposed to propel you somewhere. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Everybody can look at a piece of artwork. Somebody look at these little little flowers on the tree branch and somebody will see it totally different than you might. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So and and to your point as well, the the putting people in a box is the probably the antithesis of any art in, in general, mm -hmm. right? Like for, yeah. for music, we're talking about commercialism and and certain things you're supposed to talk about uh, in my, uh, I guess, discipline, we call it where in stand up, there's certain words and certain things you're not supposed to bring up, which mm. should be at the discretion of the person speaking or making the thing, right. you know? Yeah. Well, hey, man, you know, they started that stuff with Lenny Bruce. Oh, yeah. You know? Right. Right at the beginning. I mean, come on. We know it's like, no, you can't talk about that. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> that was back. Who when are were... you to tell me what I could talk about? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When they had obscenity laws, which I mean, what's more subjective than what you find obscene? Right. You know, it's they, they would have police officers before he even started the show waiting for him to finish and then yeah. lock him up. Crazy. Time. Yeah, you see, you see, that's the horrible dichotomy of this whole American uh, standpoint, uh, um, the, 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 the horrible like. You're built on a country that savagely raped, separated families, you know, did all of this kind of stuff, yet you won't allow an artist to talk about that or to say anything nearly close to it. But how vulgar, how much more vulgar can you have gotten from the things that we've seen happen? Sure. The Trail of Tears, the millions of uh, indigenous people that were just murdered and slaughtered. You know, and then you talk about the transatlantic slave trade, and then you just talk about all of this heinous stuff that has happened, but you're not allowed to talk about that. And now they don't want you to even to remember it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, fact is, uh, what's the saying? Fact stranger than fiction, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, because you brought up um, how you, uh, you're, uh, you're a teacher. You work at um, Brooklyn College, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, does does working with uh, young people, does that help you kind of stay in tune with with the modern uh, the modern way music is going? Is that something that helps you? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But but it, but but what it does also is allow me to. A lot of the students that are coming through music schools, per se, are studying music in schools they're not getting it from the aspect of um first of all there's no conversation about how music should enhance your uh your your humanity and your spirituality so the things that i do as an experiential teacher we talk about those things you know we don't just talk about we don't just look at a book and read notes from it and then try to learn the inflections on the notes we we talk we look at the artist and why did he write that certain melody? What was he going through and what was happening in the time of the of America? Jazz has gotten to a place if I'm like I'm teaching jazz, all right? For example, the small ensemble and the big band. And at the time, I have numerous students. I don't I can't teach them one by one theory or certain scales to use. We can do some exercises. But at the core of the music, what I try to teach them is that this music has value more than just its technical prowess. It has value because it came from a person that was going through this at this certain time. Sure. Right. And if you look at the music that was happening, music is a statement of activism, is a statement of trying to propel our culture forward. You know, um, you can specifically look at jazz music where musicians were forced to play a certain type of way for entertainment. You have another uh, portion of that historical music changing to what we call bebop and hardbop, where the musician decided, hey, I'm going to hone my skills and this is going to become, Amer this is America's classical music because it's the highest form of folk music. I'm able to improvise. I'm able to do these certain things. So the music should be uh, 
positioned as a classical art form and as an art artist artistic statement, not just as entertainment for you to come and either tap your foot to or to eat food to or to look at black musicians as their you know buffoons or or in minstrelsy. You know, there were steps that happened. And so in, in jazz history, when you're learning this music, it's important that the student understands that. Uh, because if they just think by playing uh, a jazz standard very well, they're a jazz musician. No, you're not. It's a whole lineage and a whole history that's involved in that music. And that's what I try to teach more so than just, you know, teaching them to play two five ones or to navigate through the chord changes. It's a lot more to it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're showing them where, why this person's playing this. Right. Right. Yeah, I love that era of jazz, by the way. Bebop might be, oh, yeah. it might be my favorite. Because, yeah. you know, there's parts, don't get me wrong, I love listening to Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter and, and Coltrane, but there's there's parts of me that sometimes I like to be a, a bit of a, of, a, of a lunatic in the sense that mm. I, like, I move quick. So yeah. when I hear, if I'm like out and about and I got like Diz or Bird or whoever in my headphones, I'm like, ah. it, it makes me want to, yeah. you know, it, it does something. And that's precisely what it was supposed to do. Right. That music was that music came directly out of the orchestrations and the harmonic and the rhythmic concepts of Duke Ellington and Fletcher Henderson's, right? Who were genius in giving them, showing them how they can expand, first of all, harmony and rhythm. But they were genius because the the things that the music that they wrote was so important, they were able to still be entertainers to be able to pay their musicians for 30 and 40 years, right? Sure. They were still looked at as entertainers because the music was allowing people to dance to it, you know? Right. Duke, as he got older, his music was telling the story, telling the story about the civil rights movement, telling the story about, you know, how uh, black churches interpret the Bible and all of these types of things, you know? He was brilliant, uh, you know? Um, but he laid the groundwork. What he did, the musicians that came out of him Bird, Train, all of those people, they were like, okay, now we have to take this to a place where people have to think when they listen to the music. Mm. And that's what Bebop does. At first it came and it was like, man, that stuff is so fast. How are they doing that? I have to just try to compute it. <laughs> you yeah. know? So it took it from, it took it to another place as an art form, as opposed to just entertainment. Right. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I, I, I do think that that might be my favorite, my favorite genre of jazz to listen to, for sure. That's pretty cool, man. It's yeah, pretty cool. yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now we, yeah. we're we're running we're running low on this one too. Okay, ten more minutes on this. Okay, that's fine. We'll we'll do ten more and then and then we'll wrap up. Not a problem at all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you before we do wrap up, I wanted to hear about uh, what you do with uh, your nonprofit, the World Rhythm Academy. Okay, so um. World Rhythm Academy, we go into different communities. We bring art and we had um, several programs. We worked in uh, Brownsville, uh, the Collaborative Middle School, where we had a geo arts program. My wife is a geographer. She's a scientist. Uh, and so through some of the things that she would uh, bring in different places in the world, I would teach the students about the culture and the music from those different places in the world, authentically sharing them how I played it and, and have sent it authentically sharing with them some of the sounds and the music from those different places. Very successful program because people, students nowadays, they don't get that, you know, they, they only learn about a few things. But meanwhile, I'm, we're talking about Malaysia and the certain things that are happening geographically, the type of terrain and other places where there's volcanoes and this, that, and the other. And then I would talk about the music and show them different art and literature that reflects how those people live through those types of places for, you know, thousands of years. Um, and how the music is part of their whole cultural aspect. Every day is something to do with music. Um, and then we have a Jin to Jin program where we uh, go into senior homes and we bring young people in with us and they talk about music. And some of their favorite music turns out to be the same music. You'd be surprised a lot of young people nowadays, their favorite music isn't hip hop. Mm. It's uh, 
1970s, Earth, Wind, and Fire, or, or you know, bands that were actually telling a story. Sure. You know, so and then and then they talk to an elder. And it's like, oh, I knew those boys, you know, and they could connect the dots. And then you break down elders being afraid of youth and youth think, thinking that elders have nothing that they can offer them. You know, it, it opens up a bridge for conversation. Sure. We do those types of things. We do a summer festival every year at certain parks and underserved communities. And I bring musicians from locally and musicians from outside. And we just have a party, a festive party. We raise enough money to feed the entire community where we're giving it. So we do those types of things. Um, here in New York, coupled with my nonprofit, I have a production company called Roborage Productions. We do uh, educational dialogue concerts and jam sessions at a place called Soul BK on Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn. Every Monday night, students from different colleges, primarily Brooklyn College, because I'm there, they come and they get to play. They get to play with uh, veteran musicians from Crown Heights or other places in Brooklyn that come and frequent it. And we have dialogue and talk about the music and play all types of different music, you know, from uh, rhythm and blues to gospel to jazz to everything. And then every other Monday night, I have um, guest artists. This past Monday, this week, I had Ahmed Abdullah, who's a incredible trumpeter and educator from the new school. He played with Sun Ra for about 30 years. Mm. So he talked about Sun Ra and he just wrote a new book about Sun Ra. He just gave me a copy. I forget the name of it, Celestial something. So he talked about that for an hour. Then he played and then he jammed with the students and they got this opportunity to learn this whole other side of music. Uh, our next guest is Bobby Sanabria from the Bronx. Bobby's uh, an accomplished percussionist. Um, who's played with everybody, Cheeto Puente, all types of people. You know, he's going to come and tell his story, how music of the Black experience uh, propelled him to play music. And we have various uh, um, um, NEA jazz masters, you know, coming on Mondays to commune with the students. And so we have that going on every Monday. Yeah. Uh, and it's connected to my nonprofit because um, that's how it all started. That's really cool, man. I love that. I love that. Giving giving people a uh, an opportunity to connect with each other through, you know, through through basically we've been talking about the human experience mm -hmm. about other places and and understanding that we're not so different from each other. I love I love all that, man. For yeah. sure, it's a lot of work, man. I'm exhausted all the time, but it's a good exhaustion. I'm also a bike rider. I'm I'm trying oh, to train yeah. for this five barrel bike ride coming up yes. that I'm registered for. They keep hitting me up. Are you ready? Have you done your so and so miles? <laughs> so I love that. I just got a nice new bike, man. A road uh, bike. Woo! It's fast. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm into that too. I got a trek. I'm staring at it right over here right now. So okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, hey, man. Listen, this was a lot of fun. Where um where can people find you in terms of uh, website, social media, and maybe maybe where you're playing again? Maybe you got a show coming up or something. Absolutely. I have tons of shows coming up. Um, I will be at Lincoln Center Dizzy's on the uh, 27th, 28th, and 29th of this month. Um, it's a project that I'm producing with the South African trumpeter. It's called Salsa, which is South Africa, USA, right? Easy name. Uh, it's an all-star band. You know, I have Vernon Reed playing guitar from Living Color. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Living Color, but oh yeah, Cult of Vernon Pres Reed is playing with us. Uh, Jay Rodriguez on Sanch on saxophones, and incredible uh, bunch of musicians. We're going to be doing a eclectic. So that's that's happening this month. My website is RonnieBarrage.biz. R O N N I E B U R R A G E dot B I Z. And then our nonprofit is worldrhythmacademy.org. Um, and yeah, so you can and uh, just put stuff in Google and it'll come up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right now, we're really extremely blessed. I am blessed with the um, work that is coming. You know, I'm, I've been contracting a lot of uh, wonderful music events, putting together uh, bands to do big orchestrations and things, uh, University of Indiana. Um, and right now it's a good period. It's a lot of work. I'll be in Europe pretty much all of June and July touring with the McCoy Tyner Legends Band, which is um, 
I got my start with the great McCoy Tyner, uh, playing with him for about three years as an early, from the age of 18 on. So Awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ronnie, for coming on. We'll do it again. Maybe I'll come see you in person. I, uh, I'd love to watch you play. Yeah, um, man, and let's get us some bike rides in. Hell yeah, I would love that. We'll, we could train yeah. them. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you, guys. Peace.